You know, the most unwelcome message, even today, is the voice of the prophet. The world will not have a man contradict its philosophy of life. Friends, if you're going to be popular today, and this is true of preachers, you've got to sing in unison with the crowd. The world does not want to hear the voice of God, especially when that voice speaks of judgment. Well, there's no shortage of voices fighting for our attention. We're literally bombarded with them every waking hour of the day. Who will we listen to? Welcome to another great study on Through the Bible. Our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and our text for today is the beautiful second and third chapters of Luke's Gospel. This Christmas story never gets old, does it? Well, we'll meet some amazing people today, people that had long waited for the indescribable first Christmas gift, the gift of the Lord Jesus. First, we'll be introduced to Simeon, whose prophecy was both exquisite and painful. And then we'll stand with Anna, a prophetess who stood for God for decades, waiting in her old age for the redemption of Jerusalem. They both listened to God's voice in a time when people had forgotten all about him. God rewarded them with a very unique opportunity. And then we'll hear about Jesus' growing up years and the only record of his life before he was 30 years old. And then finally, John the Baptist appears, ready to launch his ministry and announce Jesus' coming ministry. It's a great day to be in God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your Word and learn what it takes to walk in faith and in truth. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We were talking last time in the second chapter about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and what a wonderful human story it is as Dr. Luke gives it to us. But it's not only just a human story, it's a divine story. And just as he's the God man, we have a God book here also. And this is one of the wonders of it is how it presents him. Now, as I come to verse 31, You'll recall that I left off, I broke off with the song that was being sung to us by Simeon. Dr. Luke gives us the songs of Christmas, which you will not find in any other gospel. And this is one of them. Simeon, who was there in the temple, he had been promised he'd see the salvation of God. And he says, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. That's verse 30 which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. This is a remarkable statement coming from a man that we would say that he was limited in his outlook on life. Certainly, he would be limited to that particular area geographically, and yet he is looking at one who is to be the Savior for all the world. This, to me, is one of the amazing things about the Word of God although given to a certain people, especially the New Testament, it's certainly directed to the world, and no other religion pointed that way. You will notice the religions of the world are generally localized for a peculiar people, uh, generally a race or a nation. That has been true of Shintoism, Buddhism, Mohammedanism, but Christianity has been for all people. This is a remarkable statement in light of that. It says, For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And the salvation was a person, as we've indicated, and that person is Christ. Now, this was an amazing statement, and the reaction of Joseph and his mother amazing. And you notice it doesn't say his father and his mother. It says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, his mother, behold, the child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
Mary paid a tremendous price to bring the Savior into the world. It was an awful price, to tell the truth, to have to stand beneath the cross of the Lord Jesus and see him die. The cross of Christ has moved many people. Artists have painted the picture. Songwriters have sung about it. Preachers have talked about it. And there's a danger of dwelling on the sympathy angle because he didn't die to elicit anyone's sympathy. He doesn't want your sympathy. Right here in Luke, he'll tell the women who are weeping, weep not for me, weep for yourselves. If you have tears for Jesus, save them and save them for yourself, not for him. He doesn't want your sympathy. He wants your faith. But the amazing thing here is that his mother paid that tremendous price. She stood beneath the cross and looked up at him. It was not sympathy. It was a broken heart. And that's when this was fulfilled. Yet a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And for him to become the Savior of the world, it was necessary actually for her to have to endure this. Now, don't misunderstand me. Her suffering has nothing in the world to do with your salvation. And her suffering had nothing in the world to do with her salvation. But it had something to do with bringing him into the world, raising him. He was her son. You see, when our Lord looked down at him, he said to her, says, Woman, behold thy son. And there was a human relationship there that no one else had at all. And she's suffering in that particular connection. Now you have another one here. My, we've got a lot of solos here. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. By the way, I can't refrain from saying this. There are those that say the 10 lost tribes are 10 lost tribes. If you go through the Bible from the time they returned after the captivity, you can pick up practically all the tribes. Here's the tribe of Asher. Evidently, Anna didn't get lost. She was of the tribe of Asher, and that's supposed to be one of the ten lost tribes. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years. I don't think she'd been a widow that long. She's 84 years old, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. And she gave thanks. I don't have her song here. I don't have the music, but she sang here as you can see. Now we're told And Dr. Luke just passes over what Matthew tells us about going down into Egypt. Because, you see, the coming of the wise man does not fit into Luke's gospel. You say, why? Well, who was it that the wise men came to see? The ideal of the Greek race? Of course not. They came, and their question made it clear. Where is he that's born king? We're looking for a king. Matthew presents him as the king. Dr. Luke presents him as the perfect man, and notice how he'll carry out his purpose even at this point. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, he entirely omits the fact that they went down into Egypt. Does that mean they didn't go down into Egypt? No, it just means that Dr. Luke is writing for a purpose, Matthew writing for a purpose. And if you just let these writers alone and let them tell what they want to tell you and listen to them, you'll learn a great deal more than listening to the critics, I can assure you. Now, will you notice verse 40? And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Who is Luke presenting? The perfect man. Dr. Luke would naturally want to look at the boy. He was not only the obstetrician, he's the pediatrician here. And he says the child grew, and he waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. How did he grow? Will you notice? He grew physically. He waxed strong in spirit, spiritually, filled with wisdom, mentally. He grew mentally, spiritually, and physically. And the grace of God was upon him. 
That's the story of Luke. Now we have here an incident that only Dr. Luke records. And why does he record it? Because of the fact that he alone is the pediatrician that's going to lift out of the life of the Lord Jesus one incident when he was 12 years old. We have no other record from the time he was born till the time he began his ministry. We call those the silent years. Now, I do not frankly consider them silent years. I have a little book entitled The Silent Years in the Life of Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not offering it now on the program, but you could order it if you wanted it. And I fill those silent years up, friends. I think they're filled in the Scripture if you just look for where it is. And here is one incident, of course. Now, it's the incident of when they went up to Jerusalem. And when they went up to Jerusalem, here is the record, verse 41. Now his parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Now, Dr. Luke is saying they went up every year, but here's one incident I want to tell you about that took place when he was 12 years old. Now, I'm sure we're all familiar with this, and especially you've seen Hoffman's picture of Christ among these learned doctors up there. When they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. You see, they're raising him as a normal child. He didn't run around, friends, with a halo on. My, these middle-aged artists got some very funny conceptions of our Lord Jesus, both as a baby, as a boy, and then as a full-grown adult. I don't think he looked like any of them, to tell the truth. And he just grew up as a normal boy. You see, they went up to Jerusalem in companies. And there's a little town right north of Jerusalem. That's where they missed him. And that's where all these families that came from the north, well, they got together there and they came into Jerusalem for the feast days. And when they left Jerusalem, why, all the families are getting together and they meet up there at that place. Then they start out. And lo and behold, Joseph says, where's Jesus? Mary says, well, I thought he was with you. And he said, no, I thought he was with you. And they began to look, and they missed him. And so they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. And when they got back there, where do you suppose they found him? Well, they found him in the temple, and they found him there right in the midst of them, both hearing them and asking them questions. And he was asking them questions that they couldn't answer. Verse 47, all they that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. He had the answer, apparently. Now, they made it very clear. I think they were a little provoked, actually. His mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, notice his answer to him. How is it that ye sought me? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? And his father's business, and I think this is interesting here, if Joseph was the father, he could have stepped up. He said, well, what are you trying to do? Get some carpenter work here in Jerusalem? But my friend, he never did carpenter work in Jerusalem. He did carpenter work up in Nazareth, and he's not looking for that. His father's business is his heavenly father. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And let's notice that. They didn't understand it. Mary, at this point, did not appreciate exactly who he was and what he's to do. She's pondered these things in her heart. Now, verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was subject unto them. And I think that's quite interesting in this day when even 12-year-olds today are demanding to be heard. I get a little weary, don't you, if they tell us today that the college students have something to say and we ought to listen to them. I've listened to them. They certainly are giving them plenty of publicity on radio and TV, and I haven't heard them say anything yet. I personally don't think a college student has much to say. That is, I feel like he's green back of the ears, and I don't care what his IQ is. That's nothing. I know men with PhDs and a high IQ, and they don't have sense enough to get in out of the rain, and I can prove that because I moved with that crowd when I was teaching, and friends... There are a lot of dumb PhDs. And the important thing here is that the Lord Jesus was subject to his parents. He was subject to them. And 
This is an amazing thing. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now, the important thing that I want you to notice is verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Would you like to have Dr. Luke's report about the boy Jesus and those silent years? Here it is. He increased. He grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and he grew in favor with God and man. He grew physically, he grew mentally, and he grew spiritually on all three levels Why he's growing. That is the picture that's given of him here. Now, chapter 3, we have the ministry of John the Baptist, and I'll probably get down through this section here. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene. And believe me, we have a whole lot of detail given to us here. The fact of the matter is, Luke is a stickler for accuracy, you see. Six characters are identified here to give the time. You could be able to date this. There is a message in these names and point of history. Caesar Augustus was emperor when the Lord Jesus was born. And now Tiberius Caesar was emperor. Profane history will have to supply us with the data. Tiberius Caesar was brilliant, but he was brutal. He was clever, but cunning. He was inhuman and profane. He attempted world mastery. Then the puppets are given, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Why too? Well, that reveals the power of Rome over the religion of Jerusalem in that day. The fact of the matter is, old Annas was the power back of the throne, but Caiaphas was the one that Rome put out in front. And the normal experience of John would have been for him to have been serving in the temple in some capacity under such leadership. But he despised it. He went to the wilderness. He renounced his priesthood under such a corrupt system, and he became a prophet. That is the picture. He was a priest. He became a prophet. Now, John the Baptist is one of those striking characters who appear from time to time. He reminded the people of someone who'd gone before because of a certain similarity in his methods. They thought he was Elijah. He was so different that he also reminded folk of no one who had appeared, but of a great one to appear, the Messiah. John the Baptist is a paradoxical person. And here in Southern California, where we use the word unusual very glibly, even in referring to the weather, I don't care what kind of weather we have, it's called unusual, the words lost the sharpness of its meaning. But John the Baptist was truly an unusual man. Luke told us that he had a miraculous birth. We've seen that was attended by a visitation from the angel, from Gabriel. His entire boyhood's passed over here. And the next event in his life, which Luke records, is here in this chapter 3, beginning of his ministry, and that occupies our attention. He was a priest, a prophet, and a preacher. By birth, he was a priest, the son of Zechariah. But he was also by call, by the choice of God. He was a prophet of God. And the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, that we are told. And he came into all the country about Jordan, verse 3, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He was preaching the baptism of repentance. He's the last of the prophets. He's actually an Old Testament character who walks out on the page of the New Testament. He's picturesque. My, to see it, he was unshaven, shaggy, wore camel's hair. His dress, his diet, his looks, all was different. And he received the same reception that all prophets received. He was put to death. You know, the most unwelcome message, even today, is the voice of the prophet. The world will not have a man contradict its philosophy of life. Friends, if you're going to be popular today, and this is true of preachers, you've got to sing in unison with the crowd. And God have mercy today on the pulpit where it's nothing in the world 
but a sounding board for what the congregation is saying. God have mercy on that preacher. The world does not want to hear the voice of God, especially when that voice speaks of judgment. And this man John was pretty strong in his message, by the way. He says, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. He came, you see, to fulfill prophecy. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude, now here's the message of John, he came forth to be baptized of him. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I wonder how long a preacher would last in any church if he got up next Sunday morning and said, began by saying, O generation of vipers. I want to say to you, I don't think he'd be in the pulpit the next Sunday. I think the people would get rid of him. John the Baptist, he sure had an unusual introduction for a sermon. But I don't recommend it. I have taught homiletics in seminaries and a couple, and I have told a young man, I said, never begin a sermon like John the Baptist did because you won't last very long as a preacher. And I'm not sure that God wants us to use the same language today, but I do think it would be appropriate in many churches today. Oh, generation of vipers. That's a strange way to begin a sermon, is it not? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God's able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now, his message was a message of repentance. And somebody says, well, is that the message we give today? No, actually it's not. Somebody says, well, isn't repentance in our message today? Yes, I think the repentance is in faith today. Paul said to the Thessalonians, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and you can't turn to God without turning from something. When you turn to anything, you turn from something. Couldn't be otherwise. And that turning from something, that's repentance. And I think the world needs to repent. Somebody says before it can accept the gift of eternal life. Well, may I say to you, you need to accept eternal life, and when you do, you're going to turn from the things of the world. Perhaps someone's listening today. You've heard the love of God, and you haven't been moved by it, and you've wondered why. May I say to you, you need to hear the voice crying in the wilderness. Repent. Repentance is in saving faith. My friend today, may I say this to you in closing. This is not the message of the hour. I grant that. We preach the grace of God. But I want to say this to you. If you have been a recipient of the grace of God and if you turn to God, you're going to have to turn from your sin. And if you don't turn from your sin, you haven't turned to God. Repentance is there, my friend. But the message is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee made it very clear. If you haven't turned from your sin, then you haven't turned to God. What about today? Don't enter the new year with all your old burdens. Give them to the Lord and let Him make you a new creation. You can read more about this on ttb.org. Just click on the banner, How Can I Know God? Or you can call 1-800-65-BIBLE to have a few free resources sent to you by mail. If you know the Lord and you want others around the world to come to Him and to grow in the faith, join us in praying regularly on the World Prayer Team. You see, every day we've got thousands of us who come together and pray for one country, and over the course of the year we travel the entire world on our knees figuratively. You can sign up today at ttb.org forward slash pray to receive an email prompt every weekday. I think you'll really love it. I know I do. And now, in our study today, Dr. McGee mentioned the booklet, The Message of the Silent Years. You can download this digital booklet for free online, and I'm sure you'll also find many more that you'll want to read as well. We've got more than a hundred of them in the resources section of ttb.org. And if we can help you find something in particular, just give us a call at 1-800-652-4253. That's also the number to call to make your year-end donation, or visit 
ttb.org forward slash give. Now, to mail your gift in, you can send it to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And make sure it's postmarked before December 31st. Now, tomorrow in our study of Luke's Gospel, we'll go deep in the temptation of Jesus, and Dr. McGee answers the question, could Jesus have sinned? Hmm, that's a good question, isn't it? I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you then for the answer. Jesus came home, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.